Hello friends and welcome to Out of This World Television. I'm here today broadcasting from the studios of TCTV Television here in Olympia, Washington, just south of Seattle in the United States. And I have a wonderful gentleman named Wolf, Wolf Dieter Stoll coming to us live from Germany. Uh, Wolf's a fascinating gentleman. He does uh, uh, spiritual um, and scientific and, ethno uh, and cultural uh, research into plants, how they live, uh, how we use them, how they can help us from both a spiritual uh, sense and as, as well as a scientific sense. And if, with that, I want to offer uh, to welcome my good friend uh, uh, Wolf Storr on the program. Wolf, how are you doing today? Yeah, pretty good. Working a lot. <laughs> 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 wonderful, wonderful. How did, you, how did you ever get interested in plants, by the way? Well, I've always, always been interested in plants. I think ever since I was a little kid, Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up in post-war Germany and there wasn't not much to eat. It was in the uh, Russian zone of occupation mm -hmm. and the Russians themselves didn't have anything to eat. Uh, so we turned our lawns into vegetable gardens and uh, my <clears throat> grandparents picked wild plants uh, to eat and I think that must have made such a big impression on me. Wow. Besides that, uh, my grandmother healed practically everything with herbs. Uh, she came out of a tradition of herbalists in the Ore Mountains. And uh, so I got a little bit of that inspiration from the grandmother. Wow, that's incredible. That is just incredible. Well, tell me, you've written a new book recently. It's called, a, 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 the, the, your new book is called A Curious, a Curious Look at Plants. Is that well, I think I I don't I haven't received it yet. Uh, oh. Somehow it got lost in the mail, but I think it's called the Curious History of Vegetables or something. That's right. Like that. Yeah, that's right. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Good. Uh, North Atlantic Books uh, is what it is. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And one of the things in that book you you you've written that um, plants themselves have a very spiritual side to them, more than just a nutritional a angle. And you are basically what you eat in terms of your nutritional values. When you eat a plant, for example, you're ingesting their spiritual values. Is that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, we, we have a relatively primitive, reductionistic view of plants. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. seem to be just, uh, yeah, just protoplasm that uh, accumulates some kind of uh, yeah, chemical molecular ingredients. But plants are actually very intelligent. Uh, they are the most intelligent beings on Earth. We wouldn't even be here, neither would animals be here. Mm -hmm. uh, plants make up about 99% of the biomass wow. of, uh, of the Earth. Uh, they're the ones that give us oxygen to breathe. They give us, us and the animals food. Uh, they are of such molecular complexity that they can heal us and often better than our synthetic uh, products, which are very expensive mm -hmm. and have, often have side effects. I mean, you know, to consider plants as something unintelligent uh, just because they don't speak and scurry around doesn't mean, right. uh, you know, that, that there is more to them. For right. the Indians in India, for the Hindus, plants are uh, the expression or the bodies of devas. Mm -hmm. Wow. Devas, devas are beings, uh, they're divine beings. The word deva and divine, div, belong together. Deus, God, divine beings. And they're always associated with light. Huh. Interesting. They're associated with light. And uh, they transmit cosmic light to us, not just to the body, mm -hmm. not just in the form of photons, which can be measured, mm -hmm. but also in the sense of uh, spiritual light. Huh. Uh, wow. The energy we receive from them uh, gives us the energy to, uh, to perceive beyond the immediate uh, material. Wow. As, as I think plants are something really special. We just don't realize it. That's amazing. That's amazing. I know I lived in India many years ago, and they have two categories of foods, Wolf, and I, you, you're probably familiar with this, hot foods and cold foods. And hot foods are like beef or chicken, 
where, for example, the animal, like a, like a cow, for example, if it's been uh, killed, uh, killed it, there's feelings of sadness and depression yeah. in the cow. And so the in Hindus believe, Wolf, that when you eat that steak, when you eat that beef of a cow that was sad and, or, or depressed when it, when it died, you're ingesting those feelings and that's what you become as well. But plants are called cold foods, or cool foods, where they have none of those problems, none of those, those spiritual things. Well, actually, uh, it, traditionally, there are, it's this hot, cold dichotomy, but it's even finer than that. They have uh, this idea of sattva, sattvic foods, mm -hmm. which are full of light, and that is uh, milk and veg uh, veg vegetable foods. Uh -huh. Then there's the hot foods, the tamas, uh, the rajasic food, that is what people eat warriors and uh, people that need to have aggressions you know in India even the truck drivers they eat hot foods huh. and, uh, and and that's full of uh, energy and aggression and then there is a third category that is uh, dark foods that's tamasic that is where you're dull and dumb that's rotten food it's basically I consider most of our fast food in that category and so if you if you want to spiritually advance, and if right. you want to have a bright, uh, a bright soul or spirit, then you should eat this sattvic food, which means uh, plants, fresh plants, plants, and uh, and in India, milk products. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Um, I, I, what is your opinion of genetically modified organisms, plants? Well, huh. Uh, I think it is, uh, it is, it's horrible. It's, it's, um, it's a sin against creation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, for th millions of years, uh, the species have developed in accordance, in, in, in contact with their environment, have uh, genetically uh, developed in a certain direction. Uh -huh. And who are we to uh, to mix up uh, the uh, the genetics? I, I've heard in a lot of potatoes they have uh, uh, genes from the flounder. Really? Yeah, that is that is so that they can take more cold. And genes from uh, lightning bugs, you know, uh, uh -huh. by that, well, they start. When they, when they don't have enough water, they, they start glowing, but we don't see it. But electronic sensors in, positioned in the field see that, and then the sprinklers start. Oh, you know, wow. And, yeah, and, we eat that. and when, when you think that food is information, right. it is information for our bodies. And we eat potatoes, which are really a good solid food, basically. Right. We get information of the flounder. We get information of the lightning bugs. And, uh, and it causes confusion. And you know about the uh, mad cow disease. Oh, yes, right. Right. Well, that, that uh, came about uh, when uh, the idea was if you feed uh, the cows more protein, uh, then they'll produce more milk and more flesh you know right and um so uh they put uh offal you know uh, from butchered animals into the food because that has a lot of uh, a lot of uh, nitrogen in it a lot of right. protein in it right and uh we are so advanced that we can i mean we can uh fool their their senses with uh, and we can do that with various aromas uh -huh. and they that you know and they eat that and the cows a normal cow takes about 12 days a normal cow eating the fodder it's supposed to eat you know dry scrubby uh -huh. fodder sure. it's sure. 12 days for the uh, for the digestion to complete uh-huh wow the modern, the modern cows with modern feed it takes it goes a lot faster it just rushes through their system but 12 days, and during those 12 days, what they basically do is they meditate. They meditate what is in the food. Really? Uh, yeah. When they eat uh, grass, they meditate. They, they chew it. They have four different stomachs, more or less. Wow. And they, ch they chew it, and then they regurgitate and chew it again. Uh -huh. Well, and in the afternoon, I see that here because I live on... Uh, 
kind of a, this is a mountain pasture here. Mm-hmm. Uh, they sit there and they chew, and uh, while they are chewing, their horns get warmer, because that's part of it, uh-huh. because, because they're digesting, mm-hmm. uh, they're, they're taking apart what is in the, in, in the fodder, mm-hmm. and releasing the energy, and this energy is, is then sent back through the hoofs and through the horns, it's part of the digestion system. Hmm. Uh, to the cows, and uh, in other words, uh, they know exactly what has been magically uh, uh, put into the uh, into the grass or the, the food. Wow! Now, so they get cosmic energy or cosmic information. That's the important point. Incredible. Information. Now, when they eat a fodder that has been created for them, that has offal and uh, and all kinds of bad things. Uh, they get terrible information. It makes them go crazy. I see. Interesting. Am I coming across? I, I have such a difficult time because I haven't talked about this in in English for so long that uh-huh. uh, I I have to struggle to find the right words. Well, you can we can understand you perfectly well, Wolf. You're just just fine. To keep going, my friend. Yeah, keep going. Yeah, you know, so uh, what what it shows, cows that are not uh, e- allowed to eat their right kind of food uh, will start going mad co- because they're getting contradictory information. Uh-huh. They're, not wow. getting, they're not getting the light from the sun that the plants uh, took into themselves or the information of the earth. But they're getting uh, f- uh, from, uh, you know, like meats and the like. They're getting information that frightens them and makes mm. them mad. And it's the same thing with us. Mm. You know, we, uh, if we eat pure foods, right. if we eat uh, foods that have been, uh, that have nourished us since the beginning of time, right. uh, uh, fruits and vegetables and the like, then, uh, then the, and the information is good, then we'll be all right. But uh, when there's all kinds of trickery and such thing as uh, genetically modified foods, there is no other way than that we will get sick or we will uh, have, uh, you know, we'll have physical and mental symptoms because they're not separate. Sure, sure. Tell me, Wolf, you, um, you, we've talked before on my radio show. Tell me what happened in India when they used genetically modified cotton there. Oh, that's, uh, that's a tragic story. Uh, they were told by, uh, by a huge uh, corporation, I guess Monsanto, uh, uh, that they, the peasants were told they'd become rich if they used that kind of uh, seed, which is genetically modified in order to, um, you know, uh, to be able to take Roundup. The idea is if you take Roundup, if you... Uh, Use Roundup, it'll wipe out all the uh, competition vegetation, all the weeds, and, uh, and then uh, you'll have a much better crop and so on. This did not happen. The seeds were very expensive. They also had to have supporting technology like um, artificial fertilizers and uh, uh, irrigation and the like. So they, the peasants had to take credits from banks. Uh-huh. And they got so in debt that they were never able to repay it. They could no longer afford to marry off their daughters and the like. Sure. And uh, they were in such straits they were, that uh, many of them committed suicide. Oh, what a drink- shame. By drinking the very poisons that, uh, that these corporations had sold them. In the meantime, and this has been shown by Vandana Shiva, Dr. Vandana Shiva, she has received the Alternative Nobel Prize. She is a very uh, uh, fine uh, ecological activist. She saves cities. And she has documented that uh, by now 270,000 Indian peasants have committed suicide as a result. Oh, that's so, such a shame. What a, what a, what a shame. Yeah, it's, it's terrible, but uh, it does not seem to bother these uh, huge corporations because when you get rid of the little farmers, you know, the little peasant right. farms, right. Uh, then, you have, then you can have huge fields and you can put in, uh, you, you can activate uh, this 
gigantic technology. I mean, you get, get fields that are, um, you know, don't have little plots. Right. And, and, uh, and so it's not really, as far as they're concerned, it's not really such a big problem for them, you know, but it is a human tragedy and it is an ecological tragedy. Wow. Because, because Roundup does not just kill weeds, weeds are part of, uh, of the ecotope anyway. Well, uh, the, yeah. the, something very important has happened. Um, I know we talked about this on my radio show too, but the monarch butterfly now, Wolf, is almost extinct. And it's thanks to Roundup. It's thanks to Mon directly attributable to Monsanto because they wiped out all the milkweed in the Midwest now. So you have this huge monoculture of genetically modified corn. 93% of all the corn uh, grown in the United States is, mon is, is genetically modified. And there's virtually no habitat so the, for the monarchs, so the monarchs are almost virtually extinct. Yeah, that is, that is horrible to hear because yeah. I remember when I was a kid in, o in Ohio, there were monarch butterflies all over the place. Everywhere, of course. But also, not only the, the butterflies and other insects are affected, but also the bees. Oh, because uh, bees, of course, uh, they, they don't, uh, you know, they, they don't eat uh, corn, or, but they do collect the pollen. Uh-huh, sure. And, and if this pollen is genetically modified, they die. They really? Well, that's interesting because we've never heard that here in the United States. I'm not surprised right. our media is controlled, but I'm glad you're bringing up that now. Is, right. that, is that part of the reason why that so many bees have had colony collapse here and so many bees are disappearing in the United States? Is because it's, of the genetically modified corn and pollen? It's, it's part of the reason. It's not the only reason. Sure. There are, it's also the uh, new kind of insecticides that are employed. Interesting. That are, uh, you know, and we're creating an environment that's basically abiotic. Wow. And I remember when I was a teenager, I lived in Ohio. Uh, I had a car, you know, like every kid back then, 16. Sure. Uh, my first sure. car, 49 Ford. Uh -huh. A suicide knob, so you could put your arm around your girlfriend and drive to the country. <laughs> well, yeah. You know, you'd listen to the bebop music. And then um, every half hour, you'd, you'd have to basically wash the windows in the rural Midwest. Uh, the, the windshield, I mean, because there's so many bugs. Right. And and last time I drove uh, from Ohio to Illinois, uh, there was hardly any bugs on the windshields because wow. uh, it, it is this uh, this trend to create an abiotic uh, uh, environment. Wow. Wow. So, and you, when you look at the, the good, rich soil of the Midwest, right. uh, that too is is becoming ever more, uh, has ever more or less life in it, wow. ever more or less uh, carbon uh, in it, uh, and um, it, it, beca it comes close to desert soil. Wow. That's, why, that's why it needs, that's why it needs uh, ever more artificial fertilizer. You know, from a, from a scientific uh, viewpoint, Wolf, isn't it, isn't it, uh, it, it, if you only have one monoculture, for a country, like the United States has with this genetically modified corn that's much of the United States grown now. If there's any problem with that corn and it doesn't survive, we've lost the entire crop. Whereas in, 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 in the millennia past, we had many different kinds of corn, all of which were organic. And if one of, if one of the species died or, or couldn't cope with a, with, with a particular climatic change or whatever, then there would be another species or a kind of corn that would, could help out. But we don't have that buffer anymore with monoculture and with genetically modified crops, do we? Right, it's, uh, it's put on a very, very narrow uh, uh, genetic basis. Mm -hmm. Very mm -hmm. narrow genetic basis. This has happened before, something like this has happened before. A dramatic example was uh, the uh, potato blight in Ireland. Oh yes, what happened there? I know a little bit about it, but would enjoy hearing your viewpoint on it. Yeah, 1845, 46, uh, suddenly a, uh, a micro, a fungus, Phytophthora fungus, appeared in Ireland and the potatoes uh, started rotting in the ground. Uh -huh. And 
and it was uh, and since the Irish uh, depended more than anyone else on potatoes as as food right. uh, it was a terrible famine well wow. the population of Ireland at the time of 8 million was reduced to 4 million oh my gosh and uh, it meant that uh, I mean uh, a quarter of the Irish died of hunger Wow. and a quarter Emigrated. Most of them went to the states. Some to Australia. Most of them went to the states. And this was a great uh, in the 1840s. This was a great invasion of Irish, and the Irish were considered to be uh, like dwarfs, very little. But that is because for years they had eaten nothing but potatoes and uh, and skimmed milk. And uh, by now the Irish in America are as strong and big as anyone else. Right. But there were some uh, some Americans worried that the Irish would uh, would ruin the uh, Yankee race, you know. Would ruin uh, the Yankee race, really? Ru huh. ru genetically ruin the Yankee race. But what I'm saying is, yeah. um, because you know they're, they're dwarfs and they're drunk most of the time and paddy wagons oh, and the like. Yeah. I'm, but that I'm, gl is, I'm glad we've moved beyond that. So Yeah, I, I know. But that is because yeah. because goes back to a potato. Huh. Uh, and this po potato was basically, in all of Ireland, was basically one potato. Huh. It was, uh, you know, you, you take a potato and you can clone it. Right. I mean, yeah. every little eye, uh, every little sprout, sure. that's what I've done in my garden, well. uh, if you cut it out, uh, makes a new uh, potato uh, uh, sure, plant. Sure, sure. So basically, all of Ireland had one potato plant. You, you really? understand? Interesting. Sure. And and which it which means it was on an extremely narrow genetic uh, base. Kind and so if there were many different kinds of potatoes there, say like hundreds of different genetic strains of potatoes, there wouldn't have been a problem. But so all the potatoes were affected, and uh, and the potatoes were practically wiped out in Ireland at that time, and it caused mass immigration everywhere. In the, uh, and that's how the uh, Irish immigration to the states. I, now the same thing is happening with corn. Uh, oh yes, I was just going to ask you. Modified corn is on such a narrow basis. All it needs is is, let's say, a sudden dramatic uh, climate change, okay. which has happened, and it not, does not need to be uh, anthropogenic. I mean, it doesn't need to be uh, that people have too many industries or something. This has happened historically before. Right. Every wow. once in a while, there have been, you know, the myth of the... Uh, of the flood, the great floods, uh, Noah's flood. Well, that is nearly universal, and it goes back to a sudden rise in temperature of two degrees Celsius in, within a hundred years, hmm. and everywhere the glaciers in Siberia, Russia, and North America melted, and so we have the story of the great flood. Huh. When something like this happens, you need you need diversity genetically diversified plants right, right and and you we cannot afford to reduce our food plants to such a narrow basis we can, just can't afford it. it's uh, it, it's it's a recipe for disaster you know i was just going to ask you about that whether the united states has set itself up with monsanto's genetically modified corn for another kind of, it could be a corn famine for example if we had a climatic change here some yeah. ecological uh, problem it, it needn't be just a climatic change. A sudden, it could be uh, just the appearance of uh, of some microorganism or sure. of some fungus. Sure, and that's what it was in Ireland. It was a fungus. Interesting. You know? Interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, we have about three minutes left in our segment here, and I wanted to ask you about your friend, your Cheyenne Indian friend. Um, what was it? What, it's Bill Tall, I think. It, Bill Tall Bull. Tall, yeah, Tall Bull. Tall, Bull. Yeah. Could you tell me about him a little bit and his his his, his uh, viewpoint on plants and what you learned from him? Well, he was uh, he was basically the uh, ambassador for for the Cheyenne to the plants. I because see. For th because for them, plants are not just things or objects, but they are the expression of uh, spirit beings. 
Wow. And, uh, and he had the idea that plants are so they don't, they don't need to have a brain, but they are intelligent because the intelligence is not incarnated, but it is there anyway. It's like they have their bodies outside of themselves and the intelligence and the feeling is working, uh, is, is not uh, incarnate, you know what I well, mean? Yeah, sure. Okay, okay so he, uh, he, could, uh, he could, in his meditations and um, in, tra in states that we would call like trance, he could talk to the spirits of the plants. Wow. And he could find out uh, things that otherwise we try by trial and error in scientific experiment about plants. And he says that's how the ancient people found out whether plants were heal healing or not. Wow, amazing. But, but he said the plant beings are, they search us out. Wow, that's amazing. That's amazing. And us to help, want to help us. It was sure. a very interesting uh, viewpoint. Yeah. That's yeah, amazing. I, I know kind of I've, I've been in touch with Nostradamus on the other side, and he says in, in, in eventually humanity will realize that plants have, a, um, have especially large trees, if, that large trees can, when we communicate with them in a spiritual sense, they, they have uh, the ability to go into uh, other dimensions and other time portals as well. They're very spiritual beings. And... Um, and they should be respected, actually. Right. They are yeah. actually, they are beings at the, uh, at the edge uh, between the spirit world and this world. Right. They're, we have our spirits in us. Right. We can say, me, here, I. Right. But plants have, uh, are connected cosmically. Cosmically. Um, cosmically. Right. Well, we have we have about twenty five seconds left, my friend, and and this 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 segment has gone so fast. You're such a wonderful man, and I really enjoy your research too. Is there any words of wisdom you'd like to give my my listeners? We've got about uh, ten seconds left. Okay, ten seconds. Well, what I say is uh, live naturally. Uh, get in contact with the. Uh, wisdom of nature you know that's okay. that's what we have done for millions of years well thank you so much for coming on today this is out of this world television coming to you from olympia washington and thank you again so much for all listening may you have a beautiful day thank you wolf for coming on the show thank you for having me <laughs> getting information that frightens them and makes mm. them mad and it's the same thing with us mm. you know we uh, if we eat pure foods right. if we eat uh, foods that have been uh, that have nourished us since the beginning of time right uh, uh, fruits and vegetables and the like then uh, then the, and the information is good then we'll be all right but uh, when there's all kinds of trickery and such thing as uh, genetically modified foods, there is no other way than that we will get sick or we will uh, have, uh, you know, we'll have physical and mental symptoms because they're not separate. Sure, sure. Tell me, Wolf, you, um, you, we've talked before on my radio show. Tell me what happened in India when they used genetically modified cotton there. Oh, that's, uh, that's a tragic story. Uh, they were told by, uh, by a huge uh, corporation, I guess Monsanto, uh, uh, that they, the peasants were told they'd become rich if they used that kind of uh, seed, which is genetically modified in order to, um, you know, uh, to be able to take Roundup. The idea is if you take Roundup, if you... Uh, Use Roundup, it'll wipe out all the uh, competition, vegetation, all the weeds, and, uh, and then uh, you'll have a much better crop and so on. This did not happen. The seeds were very expensive. They also had to have supporting technology, 
like um, artificial fertilizers and uh, uh, irrigation and the like. So they, the peasants had to take credits from banks. Uh -huh. And they got so in debt that they were never able to repay it. They could no longer afford to marry off their daughters and the like. Sure. And uh, they were in such straits that uh, many of them committed suicide. Oh, what a drink, shame. By drinking the very poisons that, uh, that these corporations had sold them. In the meantime, and this has been shown by Vandana Shiva, Dr. Vandana Shiva, she, she has received the Alternative Nobel Prize. She is a very uh, uh, fine uh, ecological activist. She <laughs> saves cities. And she has documented that uh, by now 270,000 Indian peasants have committed suicide as a result. Oh, that's so, such a shame. What a, what a, what a shame. Yeah, it's, it's terrible, but uh, it does not seem to bother these uh, huge corporations because when you get rid of the little farmers, you know, the little peasant right. farms, right. Uh, then, you have, then you can have huge feedly before. Right. Every wow. once in a while there, there have been, you know, the myth of the, uh, of the flood, the great floods, uh, Noah's flood. Well, that is nearly universal, and it goes back to a sudden rise in temperature of two degrees Celsius in, within a hundred years, hmm. and everywhere the gl glaciers in Siberia, Russia, and North America melted, and so we have the story of the Great Flood. Huh. When something like this happens, you need you need diversified, genetically diversified plants, right? right. And and you, we cannot afford to reduce our food plants to such a narrow basis. We can, just can't afford. It. It's, uh, it's, it's a recipe for disaster. You know, I was just going to ask you about that, whether the United States has set itself up with Monsanto's genetically modified corn for another kind of, it could be a corn famine, for example, if we had a climatic change here, some yeah. ecological uh, problem. It, it needn't be just a climatic change, a sudden, it could be uh, just the appearance of, uh, of some microorganism or sure. of some sure. fungus. Sure, and absolutely. That's what it was in Ireland, it was a fungus. Interesting, you know? interesting. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Wolf, we have about three minutes left in our segment here, and I wanted to ask you about your friend, your Cheyenne Indian friend. Um, what was it, what, it's Bill Tall, I think it, yeah. Bill, Bill Tall Bull. Tall, yeah, to, Bill Tall, Bull. yeah. Could you tell me about him a little bit and his, 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 his uh, viewpoint on plants and what you learned from him? Well, he was, uh, he was basically the uh, ambassador for, for the Cheyenne to the plants. I because see. For them, because for them, plants are not just things or objects, but they are the expression of uh, spirit beings. Wow. And, uh, and he had the idea that plants are so, they don't, they don't need to have a brain, but they are intelligent because the intelligence is not incarnated, but it is there anyway. It's like they have their bodies outside of themselves and the intelligence and the feeling is working, uh, is, is not uh, incarnate, you know what I well, mean? Yeah, sure. Okay. Okay, so he uh, he could uh, he could in his meditations and um, in tra in states that we would call like trance, he could talk to the spirits of the plants. Wow! And he could find out uh, things that otherwise we try by trial and error in scientific experiment about plants. And he says that's how the ancient people found out whether plants were heal, healing or not. Wow, amazing. But, but he said the plant beings are, they search. Everywhere, us. of course. But also not only the, the butterflies and other insects are affected, but also the bees. Oh, because uh, bees, of course, uh, they they don't uh, you know, they, they don't eat uh, corn, or but they do collect the pollen. Uh huh. Sure. And and if this pollen is genetically modified, they die. They really? Well, that's interesting because we've never heard that here in the United States. I'm not surprised right. our media is controlled, but I'm glad you're bringing up that now. Is right. that is that part of the reason why that so many bees 
have had colony collapse here and so many bees are disappearing in the United States is because it's, of the genetically modified corn and pollen? It's, it's part of the reason. It's not the only reason. Sure. Are, it's also the uh, new kind of insecticides that are employed. Interesting. That are, uh, you know, and we're creating an environment that's basically abiotic. Wow. And I remember when I was a teenager, I lived in Ohio. Uh, I had a car, you know, like every kid back then, 16. Sure. Uh, my first sure. car, 49 Ford, uh -huh. with a suicide knob, so you could put your arm around your girlfriend and drive to the country. <laughs> well, yeah. You know, you'd listen to the bebop music, and then um, every half hour, you'd, you'd have to basically wash the windows in the rural Midwest, uh, the, the windshield, I mean, because there's so many bugs. Right. And, and last time I drove uh, from Ohio to Illinois, uh, there was hardly any bugs on the windshields because wow. uh, it, it is this, uh, this trend to create an abiotic uh, uh, environment. Wow, wow. So, and you, when you look at the, the good, rich soil of the Midwest, right. uh, that too is, is becoming ever more uh, has ever more or less life in it, wow. ever more or less uh, carbon uh, in it, uh, and um, it it because it comes close to desert soil. Wow. That's why that's why it needs that's why it needs uh, ever more artificial fertilizer. You know, from a from a scientific uh, viewpoint, Wolf, isn't it isn't it, uh, it it if you only have one monoculture for a country? like the United States has with this genetically modified corn that's much of the United States grown now. If there's any problem with that corn and it doesn't survive, we've lost the entire crop. Whereas in, 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 in the millennia past, we had many different kinds of corn, all of which were organic. And if one of, if one of the species died or, or couldn't cope with a, with, with a particular climatic change or whatever, then there would be another species or a kind of corn that would, could help out. But we don't have that buffer anymore with monoculture and with genetically modified crops, do we? Uh, that they, the peasants were told they'd become rich if they used that kind of uh, seed, which is genetically modified in order to, um, you know, uh, to be able to take Roundup. The idea is if you, take, if you uh, use Roundup, it'll wipe out all the uh, competition vegetation, all the weeds, and, uh, and then uh, you'll have a much better crop and so on. This did not happen. The seeds were very expensive. They also had to have supporting technology like um, artificial fertilizers and uh, uh, irrigation and the like. So they, the peasants had to take credits from banks. Uh -huh. And they got so in debt that they were never able to repay it. They could no longer afford to marry off their daughters and the like. Sure. And uh, they were in such straits they were, that uh, many of them committed suicide. Oh, what a shame. By drinking the very poisons that uh, that these corporations had sold them. In the meantime, and this has been shown by Vandana Shiva, Dr. Vandana Shiva, she, she has received the Alternative Nobel Prize. She is a very uh, uh, fine uh, ecological activist. She <laughs> saves cities, and she has documented that. Uh, by now, 270,000 Indian peasants have committed suicide as a result. Oh, that's so, such a shame. What a, what a, what a shame. Yeah, it's, it's terrible, but uh, it does not seem to bother these uh, huge corporations because when you get rid of the little farmers, you know, the little peasant right. farms, right. Uh, then, you have, then you can have huge fields and you can put in, uh, you, you can activate... Uh, mm -hmm this gigantic technology, I mean, you get, get fields that are, um, you know, don't have little plots. Right. And, and, uh, and so it's not really, as far as they're concerned, it's not really such a big problem for them, you know, but it is a human tragedy and it is an ecological tragedy. Wow. Because, because Roundup does not just kill weeds, Weeds are part of, uh, of the ecotope anyway. Well, uh, 
the, yeah. the, something very important has happened. Um, I know we talked about this on my radio show too, but the monarch butterfly now, Wolf, is almost extinct. And it's thanks to Roundup. It's thanks to Mon directly attributable to Monsanto because they yeah. wiped out all the milkweed in the Midwest now. So you have right. this huge monoculture of genetically modified corn. 93% of all the corn uh, grown in the United States is, mon is, is genetically modified. Yeah. Modified corn is on such a narrow basis. All it needs is, is let's say, a sudden dramatic uh, climate change. Okay. Which has happened, and it not, does not need to be uh, anthropogenic. I mean, it doesn't need to be uh, that people have too many industries or some. This has happened historically before. Right. Every wow. once in a while, there have been, you know, the myth of the. Uh, of the flood, the great floods, uh, Noah's flood. Well, that is nearly universal, and it goes back to a sudden rise in temperature of two degrees Celsius in, within a hundred years, hmm. and everywhere the gl glaciers in Siberia, Russia, and North America melted, and so we have the story of the great flood. Huh. When something like this happens, you need you need diversified genetically diversified plants right, right. And, and you we cannot afford to reduce our food plants to such a narrow basis we can, just can't afford it. it's a, it's it's a recipe for disaster you know i was just going to ask you about that whether the united states has set itself up with monsanto's genetically modified corn for another kind of, it could be a corn famine for example if we had a climatic change here some uh -huh. ecological uh, problem it, it needn't be just a climatic change. A sudden, it could be uh, just the appearance of uh, of some microorganism or sure. of some sure. fungus. Sure, that's, that's what it was in Ireland. It was a fungus. Interesting, yeah. interesting. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Wolf, we have about three minutes left in our segment here, and I wanted to ask you about your friend, your Cheyenne Indian friend. Um, what was it? What, it's Bill Tall, I think. It, yeah. Bill, Bill Tall Bull. Tall, yeah, to, Bill Tall. Bull. Yeah. Could you tell me about him a little bit and his his his, his uh, viewpoint on plants and what you learned from him? Well, he was uh, he was basically the uh, ambassador for for the Cheyenne to the plants. I because see. For them, because for them, plants are not just things or objects, but they are the expression of uh, spirit beings. Wow. And uh, and. He had the idea that plants are so they don't they don't need to have a brain, but they are intelligent because the intelligence is not incarnated, but it is there anyway. It's like they have their bodies outside of themselves, and the intelligence and the feeling is working uh, is is not uh, incarnate. You know what I well, mean? Well, yeah, sure. Okay. Okay, so he uh, he could uh, he could in his meditations and um, in tra in states that we would call like trance, he could talk to the spirits of the plant, uh, strong and big as anyone else. Right. But there were some uh, some Americans worried that the Irish would uh, would ruin the uh, Yankee race. You know, <laughs> would ruin the Yankee race, really? Ru huh. ru genetically ruin the Yankee race. But what I'm saying is, yeah. um, because you know they're, they're dwarfs and they're drunk most of the time and paddy wagons oh, and the like. Yeah. I'm, but that I'm, is, gl I'm glad we've moved beyond that. So yeah, I, I know. But that is because yeah. because goes back to a potato, huh. uh, and this pot potato was basically. In all of Ireland was basically one potato. Huh. It was, uh, you know, you, you take a potato and you can clone it. Right. I mean, every little eye, uh, every little sprout, sure. that's what I've done in my garden. Wow. Uh, if you cut it out, it uh, makes a new uh, potato uh, uh, sure. plant. Sure, sure. So basically, all of Ireland had one potato plant. You really? understand? Interesting. Sure. And and which it which means it was on an extremely narrow genetic uh, base. Kind and of. So if there were many different kinds of potatoes there, say like hundreds of different genetic strains of potatoes, there wouldn't have been a problem. But so all the potatoes were affected, and uh, and the potatoes were practically wiped out in Ireland at that time. 
and it caused mass immigration everywhere in the, uh, and that's how the uh, Irish immigration to the states I, now the same thing is happening with corn uh, oh, yes I was just going to ask you modified corn is on such a narrow basis all it needs is is let's say a sudden dramatic uh, climate change okay what has happened and it not does not need to be uh, anthropogenic I mean it doesn't need to be uh, that people have too many industries or some this has happened historically before right Every wow. once in a while there there been you know the myth of the uh, of the flood, the great floods, uh, Noah's flood. Well, that is nearly universal, and it goes back to a sudden rise in temperature of two degrees Celsius in, within a hundred years, hmm. and everywhere the gl glaciers in Siberia, Russia, and North America melted, and so we have the story of the great flood. Huh. When something like this happens, you need you need diversified genetically diversified plants right, right. And, and you we cannot afford to reduce our food plants to such a narrow basis we can, just can't afford it. it's a, it, it's it's a recipe for disaster you know i was just going to ask you about that whether the united in, in, and that's how the uh, irish immigration to the states I, now the same thing is happening with corn uh, uh, yes i was just going to ask you Modified corn is on such a narrow basis. All it needs is, is let's say, a sudden dramatic uh, climate change. Okay. What has happened, and it not, does not need to be uh, anthropogenic. I mean, it doesn't need to be uh, that people have too many industries or some. This has happened historically before. Right. Every wow. once in a while, there there been, you know, the myth of the. Uh, of the flood, the great floods, uh, Noah's flood. Well, that is nearly universal, and it goes back to a sudden rise in temperature of two degrees Celsius in, within a hundred years, hmm. and everywhere the gl glaciers in Siberia, Russia, and North America melted, and so we have the story of the great flood. Huh. When something like this happens, you need you need diversified genetically diversified plants right, right. and, and you, we cannot afford to reduce our food plants to such a narrow basis. We can, just can't afford it. It's, uh, it it's, it's a recipe for disaster. You know, I was just going to ask you about that, whether the United States has set itself up with Monsanto's genetically modified corn for another kind of, it could be a corn famine, for example, if we had a climatic change here, some yeah. ecological uh, problem. It, it needn't be just a climatic change. A sudden, it could be uh, just the appearance of uh, of some microorganism or sure. of some sure. fungus. Sure, and absolutely. That's what it was in Ireland. It was a fungus. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Wolf, we have about three minutes left in our segment here, and I wanted to ask you about your friend, your Cheyenne Indian friend. Um, what was it? What, it's Bill Tall, I think. It, yeah. Bill, Bill Tall Bull. Tall, yeah, to, Bill Tall. Bull. Yeah. Could you tell me about him a little bit and his his his, his uh, viewpoint on plants and what you learned from him? Well, he was uh, he was basically the uh, ambassador for for the Cheyenne to the plants. I because see. Because for them, because for them, plants are not just things or objects, but they are the expression of uh, spirit beings. Wow. And uh, and he had the idea that plants are so they don't. They don't need to have a brain, but they are intelligent because the intelligence is not incarnated, but it is there anyway. It's like they have their bodies outside of themselves, and the intelligence and the feeling is working, uh, is, is not uh, incarnate, you know what I well, mean? Well, yeah, sure. Okay, okay so he, uh, he, could, uh, he could, in his 